Good morning to you all. And believe it or not, I've heard that some people can't hear me. So if you can't hear me, give Jeff a thumbs up so we can turn me up. Thumbs down. Oh, no, not a thumbs down. Thumbs up. Sometimes you know, it's just hard to get things together. Last Sunday, Sue thought it was Community Sunday, and she baked a loaf of bread, bless her heart. And I told her, uh, that's next week. So we got that loaf. So she makes a loaf for this morning. And lo and behold, it's still sitting on the countertop at home. <laughs> Sometimes you just try and just can't quite have it. So you won't be able to smell that bread this morning waking through the room. It's a frozen piece of bread. And God help me, I can break it. So we'll get to that later on. Reverend Billy Strayhorn, one of his Advent messages, shared a story of an incident that happened uh, a number of years ago and it seemed all the children in the church were getting ready for the Christmas program. It was just about a week away. And one of the little girls was practicing her song for that program. And her mother told him that she had heard her practicing all week. And she said the tune was great, but the words were kind of off a little bit. In fact, she said, instead of singing with angelic host proclaim, the little girl was singing with jelly toast proclaim. <laughs> Sounds like my little granddaughter would do. Little Xandria, she's only about two years old now. She sings up a story. That was about that same year, one little girl told me that her sister kept asking her parents when they were going to set up the activity scene. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Kids come up with the strangest things. Today is the second Sunday in Advent. This is a church season. A season of faith and hope, of comfort and goodwill. Another word for peace would be comfort. Angels and a baby born in a, in a stable who will become the savior of all humankind. That's the story we tell. If we were suddenly to become rabbit hounds, slavering and chasing the elusive rabbit of right and being in charge, snarling at and, the and, and threatening everyone who believes differently than we do, then no one would listen to the message. All we would be hearing is the growling and snarling. And all they would see is the slavering and bare teeth. So why was Jesus born? Is that why Jesus died on the cross? Aren't his weapons grace, love, mercy, reconciliation, and forgiveness? Aren't the slavering and growling the weapons of the enemy? Well, then, if we want to claim or reclaim Christmas, then we have to reclaim the ways of Christ and our Savior. We can't be like the world we, we have to live in, but not live like it. Maybe that's why the central character of today's passage of Scripture doesn't seem to quite fit. Every year, the cycle of the Scripture and the reading is one of the most unlikely of characters, shows up in the midst of our Christmas celebration. His appearance for some is like fingernails on a chalkboard. Of course, I'm talking about none other than Jesus' own cousin, John the Baptist, standing there beside the River Jordan, hollering, Repent! It sure doesn't sound like something that's very Christmassy or very comforting either. But actually, John is proclaiming a message of comfort, answering the call of Isaiah by proclaiming the good news of Jesus. You know, Isaiah was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. The second half of the book of Isaiah is devoted to the promise of salvation. Isaiah wrote about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the man who would announce his coming, John the Baptist. John's call to make straight the paths for him meant that people should give up their selfish ways of living, renounce their sins, seek God's forgiveness, and establish a relationship with the Almighty God by believing and obeying his words as found in Scripture. Hundreds of years earlier, 
The prophet Isaiah had predicted that John the Baptist and Jesus would come. But how did he know? God promised Isaiah that a redeemer would come to Israel. And that a messenger called in the desert would prepare the way for him. Isaiah's words comforted many people as they looked forward to the Messiah. And knowing that God keeps his promises can comfort you too. As you read the book of Mark, realize it's more than just a story. It is part of God's word. In it, God is revealing to you his plan for humanity today. But just the Gospel of Mark doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus, but with the story of John the Baptist. Important Roman officials of his day were always preceded by an announcer or a herald. And when a herald arrived in, in town, the people knew that someone of prominence would soon arrive. And because Mark's audience was primarily Roman Christians, he began his book with John the Baptist, whose mission it was to announce the coming of Jesus, the most important man who ever lived. Roman Christians would, would have been less interested in Jesus' birth than in his message, messenger who prepared the way. John said, I will baptize you with water, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In John's ministry, baptism was a visual sign that a person had decided to change his or her life, giving up a sinful and selfish way of living, and turning to God. And John took a, a known custom and gave it new meaning. The Jews often baptized non-Jews who converted to Judaism. But to baptize a Jew as a sign of repentance was a, a rightful departure from Jewish custom. And the early church took baptism by a step further associated with Jesus' death and resurrection. You know, the purpose of John's preaching was to prepare people to accept Jesus as God's Son. When John challenged the people to confess sin individually, he signaled the start of a new way to relate to God. The message of comfort from John the Baptist. No one had ever been offered this before. God was in his temple or up in heaven. The, the general feeling was that while God was God, God didn't care enough about the everyday, ordinary sort of person or the things that were going on through to, uh, to be bothered with. But John says, hold on a minute. You're wrong. And when a Messiah comes, you'll see. Each and every one of you is as important to God as Moses or one of his prophets. And Messiah, who we know is Jesus, will prove it through the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's presence with you everywhere you go. In our waking, in our sleeping, walking and talking, in all we do, God is with us. And there is so much comfort in the fact that God cares for us the same way a parent cares for their child. And that's why John was trying to get everybody to clean up from the inside out. This flesh and bone tenement that houses who we are was getting ready to house a royal guest. If John and Baptist were standing here today, he'd ask the same question. Are you ready? Think of the unique relationship we have with God and how we're called to share it. And when we share with others, we're instruments of comfort. They realize they're not alone, that someone else cares. And that can make all the difference in the world. In fact, John Claypool shares this example. He says, when I was very young minister, and had not yet myself been initiated 
in the paternity of grief. I remember he called once to minister to an old farm widow. Her husband had just died, and I went with all my earnest intent to be as much comfort as I could to him. But I had never lost a significant person in my life. Most of my knowledge of, of grief was abstract and academic. And so I went and said the best words I knew to say. I tried to convey my, my care. But while I was doing that, there came into the room where, the, where we were another older woman about this widow's age. She walked across the hardly a word. She embraced this grieving person. And all she said was, I understand, my dear. I understand. Someone told me later that this second person had just lost her husband six months of hope. And therefore she came out of a, a shared understanding of what my friend was experiencing. And I could almost see the bridges of understanding coming to exist between them. That woman, who had shared the same experience with my grieving friend, had a way of connecting had a way of making clear that she understood that I was not able to because I had not walked in her shoes. That's the point of the Advent season. Jesus came into the world that he might walk in our shoes. Let me suggest that God, in fact, has, has come to this earth to live as we have to live. If God has experienced life the way we have to experience it, then it means that we can believe that God understands that none of our experiences are strange to the Holy One. Because God has chosen to share the human condition with us. There's no longer this remote sense that God is above and outside us. But there's an, there's an incredible sense that God understands from within what it's like to be a human being. The struggle is we struggle each and every day. And therefore, we can, He can give us grace to help in our times of trouble. Joe Bailey family, the Joe Bailey family, in the course of several years, lost three children. In his book, Beauty and Hearse, from Elgin, Illinois, Cook Press, 1973, Joe shared his honest feelings. So I was sitting there, torn by grief. Someone came and talked of God's demons, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved, except to wish it'd go away. Finally did. Another came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask me leading questions. He just sat beside me there for an hour or more. Listened when I said something. Answered briefly. Prayed simply. And left. I was moved. I was comfortable. I hated to see him go. The coming scripture for today, along with the gospel lesson, is Isaiah 41 through 11. And we hear John the Baptist crying, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double all for all of her sins. So God tells Isaiah to speak tenderly and to comfort Jerusalem. The seed of comfort may take root in a soil of adversity. When you see life seems to be falling apart, ask God to comfort you. You may not escape the adversity, but you may find God's comfort as you face it. Sometimes, however, the only comfort we have is the knowledge that somebody will be with God. Now, someday we will be. Appreciate the comfort and encouragement found in his word, his presence, and his people. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. 
preparing a straight highway or path means removing obstacles and rolling out the red carpet. But come to the Lord. The desert is a picture of life's tra trials and sufferings. We're not immune to these. But our faith need not be hindered by them. Isaiah told people to prepare to see God's work. John the Baptist used these words as he challenged the people to prepare for the coming Messiah. John was here to prepare people to accept Jesus, the Son of God. When John called people to confess sin individually, he signaled a different kind of way to relate to God. Kind of makes you wonder if there are some changes needed in our lives today so we hear and understand Jesus' message a lot clearer. Of courage. People need to admit the need for forgiveness before they can even accept it. Prepare to receive Christ. You need to repent. People need to denounce the world's dead-end attraction, simple temptations, and harmful attitudes. Although John was the first genuine prophet 400 years, Jesus the Messiah would be definitely greater than he is. John has pointed out how insignificant he was compared to the one who was coming. He said John was not even worthy of doing the, the most menial task for him, like untying his sandals. What John began, Jesus finished. What John prepared, Jesus fulfilled. At God's appointed time, a proclamation of comfort comes to his people. Yahweh, another name for God, will come to help his own. In the Hebrew text, the word comfort is in the plural. But it's not clear who the comforters are. The prophets and those who follow him are charged with giving comfort to God's people. The message of comfort was also proclaimed by Jesus. It is continued by all faithful ministers of the word of God. And the content of the, of the message pertains to the coming era of a renewed relationship between Yahweh and his people. An era in which forgiveness is proclaimed and experienced. One night, while conducting an evangelistic meeting at the Salvation Army Citadel in Chicago, Booth Tucker preached on the sympathy of Jesus. After the message, a man approached him and said, if your wife had just died, like mine has, and your babies were crying for their mother would, who would never come back, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying. And tragically, a few days later, Tucker's wife was killed in a train accident. Her body was brought to Chicago and carried to the same citadel for the funeral. After the service, a bereaved preacher looked down into the silent face of his wife, then turned to those attending. The other day, a man told me I wouldn't speak of the sympathy of Jesus if my wife had just died. If that man is here, I want to tell him that Christ is sufficient. My heart is broken. But it's a song put there by Jesus. I want that man to know that Jesus Christ speaks comfort to me today. Jesus sees us in our distress. He hears us when we call upon. In our present day, with all the problems we have in our society, is going, he is he's there to give us comfort. We look to him and repent of our selfishness and waywardness. This is why the story of Jesus is called good news. God cares about a broken, a broken world. God cares about the broken people. That's what Advent and Christmas is about. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Today's message of Scripture is about bringing comfort. The goal of the comforter is that we should see Christ. When someone pauses to reflect on the care and kindness we've shown, or on the ministry in which we've been involved in, all we should see is Jesus. Jesus being lived out in us. 
Jesus reaching out through us. Jesus caring for them through us. All they should see is Jesus. That's all John the Baptist saw. That's the way this season should be. It's a season of excitement and joy, but it's also a season of comfort. A season that reminds us that we're not alone. Those families of this church will be hoping this season will know that they are not alone. In their time of need. They know that others care about them. And for them, as we reach out to share with them, it's a time to remember that we are created in God's image. And God loves us so much that God sent His only Son to be our Savior. It's a season to be like John the Baptist. For unto us a child is born who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. That is the true gift of comfort given to each of you. Not only during this season, but every single day. Amen. Oh.